On clear nights, I often sit outside and stare at the night sky in wonder. I remember that the Milky Way, our galaxy, contains 300 billion stars. That the universe is filled with 100 billion galaxies. I'm amazed when a shooting star streaks across the sky. The universe is filled with so many wonderful things, many we understand, Others are mysterious, begging us to explore, to study, to explain. Today, I want to tell you about a century-long quest that started with Einstein's big discovery in 1915. Einstein realized that this thing that we feel as the force of gravity is actually the curvature of space and time. He wrote down a set of field equations, which he used to make a set of predictions. Now, I summarize those equations in the following cartoon. On the left-hand side, you have space-time. On the right-hand side, you have matter. Space-time tells matter how to move around, and matter tells space-time how to curve. Now, how did Einstein know that he was onto a good thing with these equations? Well, the orbit of the planet Mercury around the Sun wasn't properly explained by Newton's law of gravity. But Einstein's general relativity nailed it. It went further, though, and Einstein right away used general relativity to make a prediction that light that passes close by a massive object will be bent as it goes through space-time. In 1919, Arthur Eddington actually confirmed that in a direct observation with his team. General relativity also ex predicts that the universe can't be static. It must be expanding or contracting. And in 1929, Edwin Hubble confirmed that. He showed that every galaxy is moving away from us, no matter which direction we look out into the universe. The universe is expanding. Just a year after Einstein wrote down his famous theory, a scientist called Carl Schwarzschild used it to predict that there are regions of space-time where the curvature is so large, the gravitational field is so strong, that nothing, not even light, can escape. Wheeler coined the phrase black hole for those regions of space-time, but it took nearly 50 years for scientists to come to terms with this idea and to find the evidence that black holes truly exist in the universe. Today, black holes are something we accept without problem. But Einstein made one more big prediction. He predicted that the strain is equal to two times Newton's constant divided by the speed of light to the power of four times the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment divided by the distance to the source. <laughs> Just in case he didn't get that, what he said was, if matter rattles about, it generates ripples in the curvature of space-time that propagate outward from the rippling mat matter at the speed of light. Gravitational waves. Now that equation is actually Einstein's recipe for gravitational waves. It tells us that if we want to generate gravitational waves, we should go out and we should gather together as much matter as we can and squeeze it down, make it as dense as we can. The denser, the better. We should make it really lumpy, so we want to have it kind of be a bit lumpy like this. And then we want to shake it around as fast as we can. By doing that, we generate gravitational waves. When I shook my fist there, I sent a burst of gravitational waves out through the lecture hall, through you, and on out into the universe. Nature follows essentially the same recipe to generate gravitational waves. Stars are big balls of gas that are held together by the force of gravity. 
nuclear fusion in the core of those stars heats the material so that they push upwards against the gravitational force and stay there for millions to hundreds of billions of years. After which they use up all of their nuclear fuel they can no longer heat the gas, and gravity takes over again. The gas starts to collapse down, collapses in, and eventually the most massive of these stars explodes in a bright flash, a supernova explosion. The outer layers of the star are torn off, and the violent explosion rattles the matter around, generating gravitational waves that fly out into the universe. But that's not the end of the story for these stars. The internal core of them continues to get smaller and more dense until it becomes a remnant of the dead star. One type of remnant of a dead star is a neutron star. This is an object that's just 20 kilometers across but has the mass 1.5 times that of our sun. Another remnant is a black hole. If our sun collapsed down to be a black hole, it would be just six kilometers across. These are incredibly dense objects. So this is a way in which, in which nature does part of the recipe and brings together matter to be as dense as possible. I'm going to come back to those objects in a couple of moments, but for now I want to turn to the question of the day. Why not measure gravitational waves? Well, scientists have been trying to do the, just that for the past 50 years. How do they go about it, and why is it so difficult? Gravitational waves are ripples in the curvature of space-time. Curvature tells matter how to move. And so when a gravitational wave comes at me from the front, it stretches me from head to toe, and simultaneously squeezes me from both sides. An instant later, it squeezes me from head to toe and stretches me from side to side. That repeats until the gravitational wave goes by. So to measure gravitational waves is to measure the distortion that they cause. Unfortunately, gravitational waves produced in nature cause a distortion less than one part in 10 to the power of 21 when they reach the Earth. It's a small number. <laughs> you put a decimal point down, 20 zeros and a one. If a gravitational wave that size was to come past through me right now, it would change my height by 100 sextillionths of an inch. That's a comparison between the size of an atomic nucleus and a mile. Or the thickness of a human hair to the distance to Alpha Centauri, which is more than three light years away. It's incredibly small. And yet, scientists believe that they can build instruments to measure gravitational waves at just this level. This is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO for short. It's located in Hanford, Washington. And if you look at the picture, what you see is L-shaped arms stretching out from a corner building. That building hosts the computers and the instruments that are used to control the experiment to detect gravitational waves. Gravitational waves or, pardon me, LIGO, is also part of a global network of gravitational wave detectors. There are two in North America, two in Europe, one in Japan, and a, one planned for India. These gravitational wave detectors work by using lasers to measure the distance from the corner to mirrors that are hung at the end of those arms four kilometers away. Here's a simplified diagram of one of those detectors. They're designed so that the distance from the corner to each of the mirrors is identical. 
a laser is shine, shined onto a beam splitter. Half the light goes down one arm, half down the other. They reflect off the mirrors at the end, come back to the beam splitter, get recombined. And if one of the arms is just slightly longer than the other, a little bit of light leaks out onto that photodiode on the right-hand side. If the arms are exactly the same length, then no light leaks out onto the photodiode. Now, as a gravitational wave passes, it stretches the first arm and squeezes the second, then alternatively squeezes the first arm and stretches the second and continues in that cycle as the gravitational wave passes by. The result is a little bit of light arriving on the photodiode that gets converted into an electrical current and gets recorded for later analysis. Our group here at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee is part of an international collaboration that will analyze data from that global network of gravitational wave detectors to hopefully measure for the first time gravitational waves. So what do we hope to find? Well, this brings me back to the original point of the formation of remnants like neutron stars and black holes. These are incredibly dense objects. And what we think at this time is that pairs of neutron stars or black holes that go around each other in orbit are likely to be the strongest sources of gravitational waves and the ones that we will first detect with these detectors. Using Einstein's theory of general relativity, scientists can actually calculate very precisely what the gravitational waves will look like when they come from these, these pairs of neutron stars and black holes going around each other. And Einstein's equations tell us that as the gravitational waves are emitted from these objects, that they get closer and closer together, and over time, eventually spiral right into each other and crash together. We can also predict what that current at the photodiode should be like. And I can convert that prediction into a sound. This is the early part. The black holes are going around. They're getting closer and closer. until they merge. <laughs> Isn't that the most beautiful sound in the world? <laughs> so that is one of the predictions of gravitational waves that, uh, that scientists believe may be measured with these detectors that we're building. Next year, LIGO and its partners will begin to operate those detectors. Coincidentally, it's the anniversary of Einstein's big discovery, 100 years before he would have discovered gravitational waves. Pardon me. 100 years before he would have discovered general relativity. Um, when these detectors turn on, I hope that within a couple of years, they'll bring us the first whispers from the universe that allow us to hear the gravitational waves that Einstein predicted.